Daniel chapter 3. You know, um, one of the things that uh, we kind of have going on in our world today is this whole situation where people's um, attitudes um, towards morality, attitudes towards truth, um, attitudes towards uh, our responsibility to others in our community and in our nation, all that stuff's changing. And one of the things that happens in the world of pollsters is that they go through and they'll do polls uh, kind of routinely on certain subjects. And uh, I've got a couple of um, polls here that I went through and, and looked at um, just lately. One is a Gallup poll. And uh, in this poll, the title of it is, Three in Ten Americans Say They Believe the Bible Word for Word. The article goes on to say, Americans taking a literal view of the Bible has declined over time. Modern society frequently challenges the Bible as the actual word of God. However, a recent Gallup poll reveals that three in ten Americans interpret the Bible literally, saying it's the actual word of God to be interpreted literally, word for word. A breakdown of the Gallup poll reveals that the majority of Americans believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God rather than the actual word of God or a book of fables, legends, history, and moral precepts. Gallup polls have tracked whether Americans take the Bible literally for the past 40 years. The overall findings from Gallup show that the percentage of Americans taking a literal view of the Bible has declined over time from an average of 38% from 1976 to 1984 to an average of 31%. Now, I didn't look up the stats from before that point, but I can guarantee you that there were guys in 1984 who were using the um, Gallup poll to show the decline of American belief in the Bible at that point. And so we've been on a downward spiral as, as far as belief in the Bible goes. It goes on and says, however, highly religious Americans, particularly those of Protestant faiths, still commonly believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible. 54% of those who attend religious services on a weekly basis believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible, which is more than twice the percentage of those who attend church less often. Um, it goes on to say that um, the Gallup poll also shows that belief in a literal interpretation of a Bible declines as a person's education increases. And then it begins talking about the belief of the Bible in different groups, different Christian groups. Other results from Gallup show Protestants, including those who identify themselves as Christian but not Catholic or Mormon, are most likely, the most likely religious group to believe the Bible is literally true. 41% of Protestants hold this view, while a slightly larger 46% take the Bible to be the inspired word of God. Two-thirds of Catholics believe the Bible to be the inspired word of God, while 63% of those with no religion think the Bible is not the word of God at all, but just a book of fables. If you got church people who don't take the Bible seriously, being the salt and light in the earth, you're going to have some problems. You're going to have some problems. Here's another one. How teenagers' faith practices are changing. And this is uh, from uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, July 12, 2010. Uh, David, this is from the Barna Group, um, and the director of research there pointed out that some of the changes may go unnoticed by church leaders because the most visible activities, teen church attendance and youth group involvement, have not changed much in recent years. Bible reading was also roughly on par with previous Barna tracking of teenagers, further confounding a clear picture of teen faith. Kim Kinnaman uh, commented on the findings. And he said, while there is still much vibrancy to teen spirituality, it seems to be thinning out. Teenagers view religious involvement partly as a way to maintain their all-important relationships, yet perhaps technology such as social networking is reconfiguring teens' needs for relationships and continual connectivity, diminishing the role of certain spiritual forms of engagement in their lives. And then he sums it up with, talking to God may be losing out to Facebook. One of the things that he noted was that um, the survey question specifically asked if the survey respondent had explained your religious beliefs to someone else who had different beliefs in the hope that they might accept Jesus Christ as their savior. And among born again Christian teenagers, the proportion who said they had explained their beliefs to someone else with a different faith uh, in the last year had declined from nearly two thirds of teenagers in 1997 to less than half of Christian teens in the Dem December 2009 study, 45%. Kinnaman noted, Christian teenagers are taking cues from a culture that has made it unpopular to make bold assertions about faith or be too aggressively evangelistic. Some of the Barna Group's other 
research shows that the vast majority of these students agree with the statement, it is cool to be a Christian, yet fewer young Christians apparently believe it is worthwhile to talk about their faith in Jesus with others. And it goes on with a number of different um, other um, situations that go on. And basically what, you, what you've got is a situation where the church in general, and I'm you know, talking about obviously other churches because ours is practically perfect in every way. <laughs> you know I'm joking. But the, the church in general has this decline going on and basically much of it has to do with worldview and it has to do with, I don't know, having a spine. You know, the, that kind of thing. And biblically, the Bible says that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the reason I went through and, and gave you those two polls and talked about it is because we're going to talk this morning about um, three guys who were in their early 20s who not only had a biblical worldview, but they had a spine and they were willing to stand up to whoever and let them know what was up. And it's one of my favorite stories. And hopefully, if you haven't heard it before, by the end of this, it'll be one of your favorites. Let's start off in uh, Daniel chapter 3. Before we do, let's pray. Father, we just want to come before you and thank you, Lord, that, um, God, we have a faith that is worth sharing. We have a walk with you that's real. Um, you are God, and you don't change, and that makes it good to serve you, because the same God who is gracious in, in the Bible is the same God who's gracious to us, the same God who delivers in the Bible is the same God who will deliver us. And the same God that saves in the Bible is the same God who will save us. Your creator, you're awesome in power and in wonder, like we just sang, and there's a reason that we serve you. And the, there's a reason that we're not ashamed of you. And so God, we just pray that as we're going through this study, that you would help us to be people who would stand up for you and uh, declare our allegiance to you. God, we wanna pray for those that may be here this morning that don't know you yet. And God, just pray that by the end of the study that they'll see a reason to want to follow you and uh, uh, have a desire to come to you because you are good. And again, you are somebody that's worth standing up for. So just speak to us through the word now. We pray that you do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the government, <clears throat> uh, of the, excuse me, of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, harp lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, and lyre, and symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. The Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up. Now, if you are ready to, at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. 
And who is the God who will de deliver you from my hands? And look at these guys reply. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. And the story goes on. There's a, there's a deal here that's going on with Nebuchadnezzar. In the previous chapter, God had given this guy a dream, and in the dream, um, uh, there was this image, this great idol, basically, that had a, had a gold shoulders and arms of silvers and belly and thighs of, of, uh, of uh, bronze, legs of iron and feet of iron and clay mixed. And God had given him the interpretation of that and told him, you're the head of gold. Your kingdom, you are the head of gold. Babylon is. But there's coming another kingdom that's lesser than yours that's going to take over yours. And then afterwards, there's going to be another kingdom that comes along that's lesser than that, and so on and so forth, until you get to the end of the days. And then the Bible says that there's going to be a kingdom that's set up that no man carves out, but is set up by God himself. And that's the kingdom of Christ. And uh, that's another whole study. But Nebuchadnezzar was ahead of gold, which is a pretty good place to be in, in that little dream that he had, that little vision that he had good place to be in. But he wasn't satisfied with that. He didn't like the idea that somebody else was going to come along and take over his kingdom. And so what he does in the very next chapter is goes out and sets up an image, probably something uh, like what he had seen in his vision. And this image, though, was not of gold and then silver and then bronze and iron and iron and clay mixed as the vision had been given to him by God. This image was made all out of gold. And there's a statement that's being made there. My kingdom is going to last. My kingdom is going to never be conquered. My kingdom is going to go on forever and ever. Lots of people think that about their lives. One of the things that was interesting, you know, it's kind of interesting about um, being older and having been younger is the um, whole attitude that I had towards life when I was a young guy. I did some crazy stuff. Um, when I, was, when I was pretty young and I got myself in some interesting positions because I just kind of didn't think things through. Didn't think things through. And so I could find myself in places that were not good. So when I was an unbeliever, I found myself underneath the Huntington Pier crawling through the, uh, um, through the, through the there was all kinds of bridge work and stuff underneath that. And I was an unbeliever, and so I was drunk doing that. About halfway through my little adventure, I'm probably out um, 150 yards off the shore, and the ocean was a little rowdy. And I was thinking, this is probably not a good place to be in, especially since I'm impaired. And so I ended up getting out of it. But, you know, there were other situations that I got myself in where I was just in a place where I was stupid because I didn't think that I could die. The older I get, the, the more careful I get, kind of. <laughs> I, st I still can do some stupid things, but I kind of have this, I, I, I've grown up with this idea that I'm going to go on forever. Well, I'm 53 now, and I know some people who are in their 60s. That's old. That's only like seven years away. That's scary. I'm getting frightened. And people in their 70s, they're ancient. They're, you know, you should just go bury them. And that's getting closer. <laughs> you know you thought that. <laughs> you get to 80, and it's like, what in the world are you still doing walking around? You know, and, and obviously, my, my mortality is getting more and more evident. This guy is a guy who thinks that not only is, does he have something to do with what's going to happen with his future, but it's not just his future. Everything that he's set up is going to go on and on and on. And he's making a statement to these people that that's what's going to take place. You can see part of that because of how angry he gets at the three guys. In the previous chapter, it was Daniel. Um, and Daniel had three buds. And these were the guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who gave the interpretation. In the previous chapter, in chapter 1, he'd had another dream. Um, excuse me. I'm mess am I messing that all up? No. 
Yeah, in, uh, actually in, in uh, chapter 2, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were involved in that whole thing as far as giving him the interpretation. They were involved in a, in a prayer meeting. And so basically what he wants is he wants the world to not only worship him, because it's probably an image of him, but worship his kingdom. And that was common back, back in those days. The kings thought that they were gods and so that their people should worship them. Well, he's dealing with at least four guys, and in this story, three, we don't know where Daniel's at. He's probably out of town um, in, in this situation, but he's dealing with three guys who don't think he's a god and aren't interested in going there and aren't interested in bowing their knee to anything that he comes up with on, on those kinds of levels. Um, they don't think that the government is God. They don't think that his, his kingdom is uh, the kingdom of God, and they certainly don't think that he's God. And so these guy, this guy has a problem with them. And so you got people in there who are treacherous towards Daniel and his friends. They, Daniel and his friends had probably been promoted over them. And so when everybody else is bowing down to this idol, these Chaldeans come forward and accuse the Jews and start naming names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Say, so they will not bow down to your idol. And whenever I, whenever I um, think about this story, I just think of this plane, because it says it was in a plane, in this image, it's 60 cubits tall. That means 90 feet, 90 feet tall. That's the a, that's a size of a nine-story building. It's huge. And so it's sitting out there in the middle of this plane. You've got all these people who are gathered out in front of it, and all these people are bowing down except for three guys who are standing up. When I was a kid, there was a, a guy named Keith Green, and uh, he was a singer, and he had an album, uh, and the, the title of the album was No Compromise. And what they had on the, on the front of the album was a uh, king or some high official going through a crowd of people who are all bowing down on their faces before him, except for one guy who's standing there alone. And the guy next to him is grabbing him by his robe, trying to pull him down to get him to conform with what everybody else is doing. And he's just standing there. Meanwhile, the, the guy who um, is riding in front of him his horse is rearing up and he's all ticked off. You can see it from his face. That's a great picture of a Christian. It's a great picture of what a believer is. Somebody who goes against the grain. You know, a lot of times people, what, what people want to do is conform. They want to be like everybody else. And you know, the, re, the real, reality here is that you're just not. You're just not. You're never going to be like the world in the first place. And the world is never going to accept you as being somebody who's like them. So why even try to be that way? And... Um, I, I kind of I took from that and from this story also the attitude that, you know, there are times when people need to make stands and they need to make them publicly and they need to do it in a way that um, is bold and uncompromising. And again, that's what these guys do. Nebuchadnezzar finds out about this, gives them another break, and in verse 14 he says, Is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up. And then he gives them a break and says, next time the music plays, if you don't bow down, then I'm going to throw you into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace, and you're going to be all done. And he ends it up with, and who is the God? If you look in verse 15 at the end of the verse, who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Nebuchadnezzar was a guy who apparently did not believe in the gods that he worshipped. These guys had had their names changed. Their names originally were Sha or, uh, not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, all names that come from the name of God. And when they became, uh, came to Babylon in their captivity, they had their names changed to um, be like the gods of the Babylonians. For example... Um, uh, uh, when you look at Shadrach um, Shadrach basically means who is like Shack. that's what the name actually means um, Meshach or excuse me um, Shadrach is a, a term that um, means who is as sh um, Shack, and then sh uh, Meshach is again who is like Shek and then Abednego is servant of Nego. They'd had their names changed to the names of these gods and when Nebuchadnezzar says who is the god that's going to deliver you um, from my hand apparently he's including his own. 
And this is the point that I'm making here. Nebuchadnezzar, I don't, I don't think that he was a full-blown pagan in the sense that he believed in all these gods. He had enough brains about him to know that the gods that he served didn't answer. I think Nebuchadnezzar was a humanist pragmatist. This guy's a political animal. And what he's doing in this situation is he's trying to consolidate his kingdom. When he says, who are the gods that are going to save you? Um, Shad and Bel and Nego and all of those gods are not somebody that he even thinks about or turns to. And this is, again, what I'm saying with this. There are a lot of people who have this concept of God that God, that the God that they serve is not a God who actually answers, is not a God who is actually there. You'll get in conversations with these people and they'll talk to you about the fact that they believe in a higher power, they believe in God, they believe in, in someone like that, but that he's not actually concerned with us or even if they say that he may be concerned with us, practically speaking, they don't believe that he's ever going to intervene in anything. And so they expect that you don't believe it either. And that's exactly what this dude is doing. Who's the God who's going to save you? It's just you and me. I've got the power. You're going in the furnace. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. And at that point, what happens is Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego get their ire up, basically. You know, um, Nebuchadnezzar, when he speaks to these guys, he says in verse 14, Is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up. There's a guy named uh, Spurgeon back in the last century, or actually two centuries ago in the 1800s, and he kind of took off from that whole thing with, is it true? And he made this statement. He said, if standing before the heart-searching God at this time, you cannot say it is true, how should you act? In other words, it is true that I'm not going to serve your gods. It is true that I'm not going to bow to your image. How should you act? If you cannot say that you take Christ's cross and are willing to follow him at all hazards, then hearken to me and learn the truth. Do not make a profession at all. Do not talk about baptism or the Lord's Supper, nor of joining a church, nor of being a Christian. For if you do, you will lie against your own soul. If it be not true that you renounce the world's idols, do not profess that it is so. It's unnecessary that a man should profess to be what he's not. It is a sin of uh, super uh, rerogation, excuse me, 18th century, a superfluity of naughtiness. In other words, it's just fake. Okay? If you cannot be true to Christ, if your coward heart is recreant to your Lord, do not profess to be his disciple, I beseech you. He that is married to the world or flint-hearted had better return to his house for he is no, of no service in this war. And the point that Spurgeon was making is walk the walk. Don't just talk it. Walk it. Walk it. When I was a kid, there was a song that came out, if you can't walk the walk, don't talk the talk. And there are altogether too many people who go around talking the talk, but when it comes down to choices, they always turn their back on Jesus and do something that's exactly the opposite of what he would have them do. And so if you're not going to live it, then what in the world would you, do you want to try to join yourself to Christ for? And obviously, I'm talking to the choir here because most of you want to follow Jesus and you want to serve him. And what I'm talking about in this situation is people who just, I don't know, they just want to be church people or something. They want to have something to do with Christianity. It makes them feel good on some level. But the reality is that there's a real Jesus, there's a real Father, there's a real Holy Spirit. They are real persons, and they really love us, and they really love you, and they really want to be with you. They really want to be your friend. They will, God wants to really be your Father. And I don't know, I would feel a little bit betrayed if my daughter ever came up in a situation and somebody said, Hey, your dad, Steve Winery? Well, I think he's this and that and this and that and I don't think, you know, starts bad-mouthing me and stuff and she doesn't stand up for me. I would take that personally. I would have a real problem with that. I would love her through it, but I would take it personally. That's what we've got with God. That's what we've got with God. He's really there and he really does care about us. That's pride versus principle in that whole first section. And then we have principle versus pride and you see the answers that these guys give. They say to him, we have no need to answer you. In the old King James Version, it says, I'm not going to be careful to answer you. I like that translation better. I'm not going to be careful to answer you. I don't really care about what my words are going to do to you 
or to me at this point, you, start, you stand up and start giving me that kind of nonsense, I'm not even going to be careful with you. It has that flavor to it. And then on top of it is, I don't even have, an, I have a need to even answer you. And it's kind of like, shut up, idiot. <laughs> I just like these guys' attitude. And, you know, part of the reason that I like this is because when I first became a Christian, I had this idea of Christians that they were, you know, kind of wimpy and sissy la la like and, and that kind of stuff. And I, you know, I didn't want to be that way, but I didn't want to do what God didn't want me to do. And I couldn't figure out how to make those kinds of stands and when those kinds of stands were important and that kind of thing. And I would run into passages like this where, you know, guys just stand up and say, you know, you can take that and you can place it where there is no sunshine. And they don't really care about what people say. And it's, that's, that just speaks to my heart. <laughs> I was always kind of rebellious before I was a Christian. And after I became a Christian, it was good to find out that there were things that you could rebel about. Just say no. Somebody comes up and tells you to do something, you know it's not what God wants you to do. And you just go, ah, no. And just get all up in them. And, you know, all up in their face about it. Not necessarily in a mean way. Obviously, they're respect respectful to him. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. And so they put the O in front of his name. You know? <laughs> they don't say, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar. But they say, oh, Nebuchadnezzar. And later on in the speech, they threw, do throw in an O king. But if not, let it be known to you, verse 18, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you set up. You know, the world has a whole slew of idols that they expect us to bow down to. And that's a situation that you've got here. There's a passage in 1 Peter in chapter 4, verses 3 through 5, it says this. For we've spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of excess, speaking evil of you. They'll give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the, and the dead. And basically what that verse is saying to a bunch of believers is we spent enough time doing the stuff that you used to do before you were a Christian. And he gives a whole list of them. And it's lewdness, that's just sexual license. Lusts is pretty much the same thing. Drunkenness, that's pretty straightforward. Revelries and drinking parties, that's what I did every Friday night, every Saturday night. I went out, bought a, a couple of kegs, brought it home to my three-bedroom house and invited 200 and, and more people over to have a party. It's what I did all the time. And then it goes on and, and talks about abominable idolatries. And abominable idolatries was just putting stuff before God. That was my life. It's everything that I was. And when I became a believer, one of the reasons that I became a believer is because I was sick of all this stuff. I was sick of it. I was tired of it. I was tired of the fake. I was tired of all the nonsense that went on. I remember, I remember sitting in um, some of my parties as some of these guys would come walking in. And I'd have a beer in my hand leaning up against the wall and we would just be sitting there talking about each other and, and somebody would get in a fight and you'd go and handle that. Somebody would pull a gun and you'd go and handle that. The cops would come with their helicopters and you'd stay in your house so that they couldn't handle you. As long as I stayed in my house, they couldn't get me. Anybody who went out on the street, they got them. And that kind of stuff. And it was just a life that was just messed up and, and tweaked and, and ridiculous. And when I finally gave my life fully to the Lord, I had friends that came from that lifestyle and were wondering what was wrong with me. Literally, in regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of excess. They thought it was strange because I didn't want to live there anymore. And this is one of those passages that's good for, for Christians who are having a problem with the world. The Bible says that you're not to love the world. You're not to, you're not to be buddy-buddy with them. Jesus said be in the world, but not of it. You don't want to look like them. And you know what? There are people in the world who are going around and they're looking for somebody who's genuine, somebody who's real, somebody who's different. Somebody who does not have the same kind of lifestyle, the same junk going on in their lives. They're looking for hope. And they're looking for change. Unfortunately, they're not going to get it through politics or anything else. Hope and change actually come through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the way that the world sees that is through people who are real. 
and who people where where people in the world can see the difference. These guys are obviously somebody who's different. Speaking of the whole political thing, the whole political political correctness thing. There are idols that the world wants you to bow down to. You have to say things in a certain way. You have to have certain attitudes um, in your classes. Some of you are about to take off to college, and political correctness is rampant in college, and you're going to run up against this. If you don't say things a a certain way, if you don't believe things a certain way, college is not a place where you go anymore and have these intellectual debates. It's all conformity. And what they're trying to do is conform you to what they believe. And you're going to have to make some kind of stand if you're going to be with Jesus. And that's just the way that it goes. You've got to figure that out. Moral relativism goes along with that whole thing. One of the, one of the things that we have going on now is uh, actually a fulfillment of prophecy. There's a passage in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 24 where Jesus was speaking. And he said, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And one of the things that we have in our society is this whole lawlessness thing. People just not, we're not a nation of laws anymore. You can pretty much do what you want. And if you can't get away with doing what you want, you do it anyway. And then blow your brains out at the end of the rampage that you go on. Or whatever you're doing. And it's like, it's like we see lawlessness increasing. And, and uh, we have this whole feeling that, you know, we got a society that's out of control. I got a story that... I read um, supposedly a true story. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's funny. An elderly lady did her shopping and upon return found four males in her car. She dropped her shopping bags, drew her handgun, proceeding to scream at them at the top of her voice that she knows how to use it and that she will if required, so get out of the car. The four men didn't wait around for a second invitation, but got out and ran like mad, whereupon the lady proceeded to load her shopping bags into the back of the car and got into the driver's seat. Small problem, her key wouldn't fit the ignition. Her car was identical and parked four or five spaces further down. She loaded her bags into her car and drove to the police station. The sergeant that she told the story to nearly tore himself in two with laughter and pointed to the other end of the counter where four pale white males were reporting a carjacking by a mad elderly white woman. No charges were filed. And increasingly, we're, we're getting into a society where it's just, it's just like that. You know, this whole shooting over in uh, um, Aurora, Colorado, uh, a couple of weeks ago, when I, when I read about that, I was just completely bummed out that somebody would take advantage of that. I don't know if you knew this, but that theater was a no-gun zone. You were not allowed to take weapons in there. The only guy who had a weapon was the guy who was going in to slaughter a bunch of people. And you know, it's, it's like I don't want to make excuses for somebody that's obviously a nutcase, but we've got a world where you take morals and you pull them out of people's lives and you do it actively. We have a whole culture where in the public schools, and God bless you if you're a public school teacher. Thank God for you. But in the public schools, we have this whole secular, humanistic, amoralistic uh, ideology that's been being pumped into kids. And they're being told, this is what they're being told, that you are an animal, that there is no God. And obviously, we know this from, from all kinds of places. You are an animal, there is no God, and that morals are relative. And basically what you've told me in that whole thing is that my life is pointless, I'm nothing but an animal. And if you tell me that for 12 years in a row, or 16 years in a row, and I believe it, you shouldn't blame me for it. And what happens with people who believe that they're animals is that they'll start acting like animals on all kinds of levels. And again, that's not an excuse for what went on there, but it's what you get. And the whole tolerance thing, you have to be tolerant of everything, except for views that speak about a real true right and a real true wrong. And you know what? Every single one of us knows that there is really a right and there's really a wrong. And you can tell not so much by somebody coming up to me and talking to me about what I do to other people, but if you come up and talk to me about what other people do to me, there is absolutely a right and wrong, right? What I do to other people is clouded and shaded by all my motives and all the reasons that I, I would do these things. But if you come up and do them to me, you are absolutely in the wrong. And that's what it's like with, with everybody. 
That's a reason that Jesus said, when you do to others, you need to do to them as you would have them do to you. That's why he said it. It's not based on all your excuses and all that kind of stuff. There's a real right, there's a real wrong, and people know this thing, and they try to excuse it. Basically, with that whole worldview, God just says no to it. There's a, there's a passage in 1 John 2.15 where he says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So in this passage, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lets Nebuchadnezzar know that, verse 17, we have no need to answer you in this manner, verse 17, if that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. And so, again, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego let him know, our God, not yours, our God, not yours, is able to deliver us. They did not doubt God's ability. They did not doubt his ability. He will deliver us from you. Whichever way he does it, we're not going to have to deal with you anymore, you little petty tyrant, basically. You could throw that in there. It's there in the Hebrew. I'm lying. The second statement that they make is, if not, but if not, verse 18, they didn't presume upon God's will. They figured that deliverance was going to happen either way. Either God was going to deliver them or not. And if, they, if God didn't deliver them, they're going to the fiery furnace, they're going to die, and they're still going to be delivered from him. And either way, I'm not going to do what you tell me to. Don't you love that? Just say no. There's all kinds of stuff that, you know, governments have come up with for, you know, thousands and thousands of years that we just need to look at and just go, ah, no. I'm not going to do that. How about that? You know, fit that into your little philosophy. See what happens there. And so what happens is what usually happens in those situations, and Nebuchadnezzar loses it with these guys. Verse 19, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, cast them into the burning fiery furnace. And these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and were cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. The reason that's in there is usually when you're going to burn somebody alive, you took their clothing off them. You threw them in naked. But he's so ticked off that he's just like, throw them in. Ah, don't bother with taking their clothes off. Throw them in. And then he talks about heating it up seven times hotter. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent, the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace, heated up seven times hotter than before. Now, if he'd been thinking, he would have cooled it off because you last longer in a cooler furnace than you would in a hotter furnace. And so that lets you know how mad this guy is. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, uh, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, Oh, true, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So three men went in, and four men ended up in there. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. That's exactly how he said it. His attitude immediately changes. He sees these guys thrown in the fire, has a statement made about their God being able to deliver them, and when he sees them delivered, his attitude immediately changes, and it's more of a supplication than it is a command. Verse 27, it says, The satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. They didn't even smell like fire. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's word, yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. 
Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss about the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. Their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Now, when you look at the end of that story, you have Nebuchadnezzar getting on their side, maybe a little bit too much on their side. Because what he does is he flips over from, I'm going to kill you if you don't do what I say, to, I'm going to kill anybody else who contradicts anything that your God says. And that's a little intense. They probably went, well, thank you very much, but maybe you don't need to go that far. But in any case, you see this total turnaround, and it happens obviously because of God's deliverance, but also because you have three kids who are willing to make a stand. When this book starts, these guys are 16, 17 years old. They're friends of Daniel. Daniel's around for a long time. That's how we know how old he was about when he first got there. These guys are probably younger than Daniel. This is about three, four years after chapter one. And so these guys are in their early 20s and they're making this kind of stand before a government official who rules the whole known world as far as they know. And not somebody like one of our, pres you know, one of our presidents or senators. A president or senator can't put you to death. This guy could do whatever he pleases to you. And these guys make a stand that th that's this bold. There are keys in the Bible to his strength. And this is really where, where I wanted to get. These guys have a strength and the Bible specifically talks about where they get it from. Number one, these guys were committed to obey. They were committed to obey. In chapter one, there was a situation where they were told that they were going to eat certain things that the king set before them and they weren't allowed to do that as Jews. And so what they decided was that they weren't going to. And they worked something out with their uh, uh, jailer to make sure that they didn't have to. Daniel 1.8 says, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. These guys were in on that. They purposed in their heart that they weren't going to defile themselves. They were committed to obey what the word says. The second thing that you see is that these guys are committed to pray. They're committed to pray. In chapter 2, when that dream comes up and Nebuchadnezzar needs an answer, it says that Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. You want to be able to stand before anybody, you're going to have to kneel before God. You stand, you kneel before God, you can stand up before anyone. One of the things that I've always noticed about evil is you take a couple of steps towards it in a way where you got a spine and you're not going to back down and evil turns its face and looks away. There's some real truth to that. I've seen some guys make some, make some real bold stands in front of people that could rip their faces off and because they were making a bold principled stand, especially for the things of God, the person who was doing all the talking and all the messing around would just back it off. And what, that's, that again is one of the things that you see with these guys. They pray. They spend time with the Lord. You spend time with the Lord, that's where your strength comes from. Compromise was not an option. That's the third thing. Compromise was not an option. There are all kinds of compromises that they could have been making in this situation. And they are compromises that people make every single day faced with things that are not even close to being the consequences that they're going to get from this. Here's one. There's nothing gained by resisting. It would be better to live. If I live, then maybe I can make a difference later on. And so why resist? Here's another one. I'm in a different culture. When in Rome, do as the Romans do, basically. I'm in a different culture. These guys think differently, and so it's probably not a big deal if I bow my knee. Um, these guys had been promoted by Nebuchadnezzar, and one of the things that they were dealing with is the fact that they were going to lose their job, obviously. Not only their lives, but their job. And sometimes you're in a position where that will happen to you. You make any kind of stand, and you're afraid you'll lose a job. Well, who got the job for you? And one of the things about Christians that we need to watch out for is many times the blessings that God gives you, like a job, can become an idol. 
And instead of bowing down before the God who gave it to you, you begin do bowing down before the job and doing whatever is required of you. One of the things I could have said was, well, I'm not really renouncing God, I'm just respecting the king. I'll just reach him by entering into his world. And his world is bowing before idols, and that whole thing, and after all, he's probably got a He's probably got an agenda behind it. He's just trying to consolidate his kingdom and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm not really bowing down to the idol. I'm bowing down in reverence to the king and that whole thing. Reach him by entering his world. And once again, having come out of the world, you don't reach many people by entering into their world. If I'm a drug dealer, I'm not interested in hearing you talk to me about Jesus as you're buying my drugs. If I'm a drunk... I'm not interested in you talking to me about Jesus while you got a beer in your hand. If I, you know, and you can go on with all of this stuff that, that people think that they're going to reach the world with. All I ever did with Christians who did that kind of stuff was mock them. Mock them. And that's appropriate. That's appropriate. Everybody else is doing it. I could have said that. I'm only going to do it once. It'll only be once, just this one time, and then we can go on and I'll never do it again. Or they could say, this is more than I can handle, and God will understand it if I don't do this. These guys are literally going to lose their lives, as far as they know, for making this kind of stand, and yet they make the stand. And in the end, what happens is the sun is walking with them through the fire. The sun is walking with them through the fire. And that's the cool thing. Jesus said, in the world you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. In Isaiah 43, verses 2 through 4, it says this, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Again, in verse 4 there, it says, Since you were precious in my sight, you have been, been honored, and I have loved you. That's in Isaiah 43, verses 2 through 4. And that's what God thinks about you. Okay, that's great for Christians. And the whole idea of having a walk that's different and making stands in front of people and, and that kind of thing. But there is a specific reason that I wanted to share this um, on this day. This is um, one of those times with our church where you may have been invited here by a friend. Or you may have been invited, you know, just maybe you're out in the park or something and somebody came up and gave you an invitation. And the reason that they wanted you to come here was because they wanted to, you to hear about who Jesus is. They wanted you to know that Jesus will come along and he'll change your life and he'll make you different. That God wants you to be with him in heaven. That God does not want your life to go on the way that it's going. That he wants to give you something different and literally something better than what you've got. And I knew that when I started this whole thing out. But one of the things that Jesus said was if you're going to follow me, you need to count the cost. You need to count the cost. So the guy doesn't go out and plow a field, put his hand on the plow and turn around and look back. And we don't understand what that means, but basically it's like this. If I got my hand on it, you ever row a boat? You know, one of the things that you have to do when you're rowing a boat is you have to keep your eye on the horizon and lock your, lock your eye on something that does not move so that when you're rowing backwards, you are, you are literally going straight. It's kind of the same thing with a plow. If you're plowing and you're constantly got your head over your shoulder and you don't have your eye locked on something on the, on the horizon, what you're gonna have is a, plow, uh, a field that's plowed like this. It's gonna be all over the page. Some people's lives are like that, all over the page because they don't have their eyes locked on Jesus. He said a guy doesn't go out and build a building without having the money to finish it. Otherwise, he gets mocked uh, for the whole thing. And the point that Jesus was making is there's a cost to following him. And the cost, you know, you guys, is reasonable. It's reasonable. If you say that, you know, just a, on a friendship level, if you come to me and you say that you want to be my friend and that you want to have this relationship with me and that you want to be part of, you know, whatever I got going, my family or something, something like that, I don't expect you to turn around and walk out and be dissing me in front of people, um, you know, in the next statement. 
If, I, if you really want to be a friend with me, you're going to be my friend no matter whether I'm there with you listening to what you say or whether I'm gone out of earshot. That's the kind of friends that I want. And I think that's the kind of friends that everybody wants. Do you think that God wants any less than that? Do you think he wants any less than that? And that's what he wants from you. Here's another thing. When I became a believer, one of the things that got taught to me was this whole idea of there is something bigger than me. You know, I was kind of an idealistic kid. By that time, I'd, I'd become pretty cynical because of some things that had gone on in my life. But I still had this idealism going on in the sense that, you know, I wanted, I wanted to live for something bigger than me. I seriously did. And I couldn't find many things that I could look at and go, that's worth living for. And when I found out about who God was, and I found out about the kind of lifestyle that he required of me, found out what it meant to, actually meant to be a Christian, I realized this is something bigger than me. This is something true. It's something honest. It's something real. It's something that's actually for real. And I'd had enough of people giving me talks and, you know, I had people come up to me and pat me on the back and say, oh, I'll be your bud, I'll be your friend. They were all my mom's boyfriends. We'll be good friends, blah, 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 blah. And all they were out for was my mom and they would, they, they would like for me to have not been in the picture at all. So I'd had a lot of that kind of garbage going on in my life and people promising me this and promising me that. And it was just a bunch of baloney, a bunch of baloney. And when I finally came to a place where somebody really told me about Jesus, I realized it's not baloney. I really have somebody who doesn't want something from me. I really have somebody here who really wants to give himself for me. The Bible says that Christ died for you while you were a yet a sinner. He didn't die for you when you were his buddy. He didn't die for you when you were, you know, saying, oh, Jesus is the best. He didn't die for you when that was going on. He died for you when you were on the opposite side, an enemy of God. And when that got told to me, I realized that's absolutely the truth. Most of my life, I've been exactly that, an enemy of God. And yet God would die for me? He would come and do that for me? You know what? Nobody lived for me, much less died for me. Nobody did. And when I came into a relationship with Christ and not only found out that there was a God who loved me, but I found people who actually lived it. And not all of them. Not every single person that I ever, that I ever ran into that claimed to be a Christian absolutely lived it. But I did know some. And when I found those people and saw the difference that God had made in their lives, it just cemented the fact that this, there is something different that's going on here. And that's what I'm saying to you. There is something different that's going on here. By every stat that you could come up with, by every psychological test that anybody could come up with, by everything that the world says that I'm supposed to be, I should not be here, I should not be married. If I was married, I should have been divorced multiple times. My kids should hate my guts, and I shouldn't have the life that I have. And it's different. And I'm telling you, the difference is because of Jesus. So in this world... Jesus has given me more than I could ever have hoped for outside of him. I wasn't expecting any of this stuff. And then on top of it, the Bible says that he delivers me from hell. And so it's not just a pie in the sky, by and by type of faith. You know what? If there was no heaven, if there was no hell, I'd still be serving Jesus. This is an awesome deal. This is an awesome deal. Jesus saved my life, literally. And he can do the same thing for you. And not only that, the Bible says that if we're not following Christ, there's a judgment that's going to come down. In fact, in one of those passages I quoted from, at the end of it, it says, in regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of excess, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. And whether or not I believed all the Jesus stuff before I became a Christian, I knew that I was accountable for a lot of stuff. And I knew that there was a good chance that things were not going to go well for me when I stood before God. And that's one of the things that I would ask you. If you died today, if you died today, if you just dropped over right now from the heat because Steve is going so long, if you just dropped over, what would happen to you? Where would you be? The Bible talks about heaven. But the Bible says that the entrance into heaven is gained by going through Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. 
And so when you look at what your life is and whether or not you're, you're right with God and that kind of stuff, where do you think that you would go? Do you know that you know that you would go to heaven? And one of the things that Jesus came for was to give you that absolute assurance that God would forgive you, that your sins would be taken care of, and that you would go into the presence of God when you die. That's even better. That's an awesome deal. I don't want to go to hell. And you know what? I deserve hell. And I could give you the verses. I can go through and give you every verse that talks about every time that I've disobeyed God, disobeyed his commandments, and what the punishments were for that. And my life was one where I would go to hell. I would go to hell. You may be nicer than me, but you're not perfect. And again, what you need is Christ. And so God offers this to you, but he offers it to you on his terms. And these are the terms. You come and you follow me. I will forgive you for your sin. I will make you new on the inside. I'll change you from the inside out. But I want you to follow me. I want you to follow me. And that means something. And what it means is you have a spine. And again, that's not something that you have to do on your own. The Bible says that God will give you the power to live for him. I can guarantee you that um, I don't think that if I was in the same position as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, smelling the fire from the furnace, that I would be sitting there all bold in my own strength going, ha, 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 I have no need to answer you. Not my own strength. But one of the things that the Bible says is that when you're put in those positions, that God will give you a voice. That God will give you the power. That God will give you the strength to do this stuff. And that's really kind of the point. God knows that you can't save yourself, so he came to save you. And God knows that you can't live the life that he's called you to without his power. And so he gives you the power to do it. Jesus said, didn't, never said, go out and clean your act up and then come to him, and then he would accept you. It's you come to him, and he'll clean your act up. And so I may not have answered every one of your questions, but I can tell you this, that God is speaking to your heart right now and he's letting you know what the truth is in this situation and he's giving you an absolutely real offer and you know it, you know it. And you need to do something with this. I don't know how many offers you'll, you'll get. I got, you know, before I became a Christian, I got witness to three times. I remember every single time, three times. Somebody told me about Jesus and they never told me what I just told you. They would just say things about God. Three times. The fourth time I gave my life to Christ. The reason I remember every, every time that somebody told me about Jesus was because it impacted me so much. The first time was when I was three years old. I was three years old and I still remember it to this day. I remember where I was sitting, sitting on a bed in my cousin's bedroom. I remember what the walls looked like. I remember every part of that. The second time I was in second grade, I remember sitting at the end of my, of, of my street on one of those railing things, talking to a girl about it, and so on and so forth. I remember every single time, but there were only three. And then the fourth, fourth time, I came to know Christ. I don't know how many times you get. I don't know how many opportunities you're going to have. And God is good, and he will keep coming after you. I know he will, but I don't know that this isn't your last time. I don't know that. And you don't know it either. You need to make a choice. You need to decide whether or not you're going to come. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are laboring and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And you need to learn from me. For, your, uh, for he's meek and lowly in heart, and you're going to find rest for your soul. Jesus said that as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. To those who believe in his name. Are you willing to receive Christ? Not just talk about him. Not just say nice things about him. That's called lip service in the Bible. Not just lip service, but really say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. And I want to be like these guys. I want to be somebody who lives for you and isn't willing to compromise. If that's you, I'm going to give you a chance to do that right now. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for these people. Thank you so much, Lord, for the time that we get to spend together in the word and for the fact that you're a God who reaches out to us no matter where we're at. You love us, you care about us. You've always known that this day was going to come. You've always known who was gonna be in this amphitheater. You've always known what I was going to say. And you prepared this time specifically for these people. 
And Father, I just want to pray for those who've never asked you into their lives and ask that you would give them the boldness to make a stand for you, to finally say yes to you. And while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, believers are praying, if you're here this morning and you know that you need Jesus and you want to give your life to him, you want to become the real deal, you want to become a real Christian, you want to follow the Lord, if that's you, you want your sins forgiven, you want to know that you're going to heaven, you raise your hand up and I'm going to pray for you. You raise it up high so I can see it. But you raise your hand. Over on my right, God bless you. Back on my far right, Lord bless you, I see you. Anybody else? You know, God gives this offer of salvation and he's real about it. He really does want to take away your sin. He really does want to forgive you. And he really does want to have that relationship with you that the Bible talks about. He really does. But you have to accept it. You have to receive it. It's like a gift. God's offering you a gift. It's not yours until you take it. Do you want it? It's not a question of if Jesus wants you. He's made that absolutely clear. He does want you. The question is, do you want him? Last moment. You're here, you raise your hand up. Up over here, God bless you. Anybody else? I see you up there. God bless you. Last moment. All right. Let me pray for you real quick. Father, I just thank you for these that have raised their hands. And God just asks that you would help them to, again, make a stand for you and to finally receive you into their lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All you guys that raise your hands, why don't you look at me, at me real quick. One of the things that I do with people when they receive Christ is I ask them to pray a prayer with me. And this is a prayer asking Jesus to come into your life. But what I'd like you to do is pray this prayer standing up, somewhat like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego just did. Everybody else is sitting down, and you're standing up, making a stand for Christ. And so... You, if you want to receive Christ into your life, I can see you guys are already standing. You just stand up right now, and I'm going to pray this prayer with you. This is going to be a prayer asking Jesus to come into your life. In the back, God bless you. There were more of you. Come on, just stand up. Don't even, don't even think about it. Just do it. This is your time. Okay. Real quick, look at me. When I pray this prayer, I'm going to pray it out loud. This is going to be a prayer asking Jesus to come inside. But this is from you. It's not from me. And I'm not the magic prayer guy or something. When you pray this, you just mean it in your heart. And the Bible says that if you call on the name of the Lord, which is what you're doing, that he's going to hear you and that he's going to save you. Okay? So you mean this from your heart. Pray this after me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I know that I'm a sinner. And I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please write my name in your book of life. I want to follow you. I thank you that you love me and that you died for me and that you rose again from the dead. And I thank you that you're coming back for me. Please give me your power so I can live for you. I give my whole life to you now. In Jesus' name. Amen.